you in peace from our King, from God, our Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we started a sermon series, remember, last week on the book and the life of Job, and questions that arise out of the book, out of that book. And last week we looked at why do we have to suffer? This week I'd look, like to look with you at what comfort does God give us in our sufferings? Would you like a little comfort in your sufferings? Yes. yes. From the Lord? Yes. yes. Right? Well, good news. God comes to comfort us. And think about this. Job endured amazingly difficult trials. And he endured and came through it and conquered. And what I'd like to talk with you about today is you are at such a greater advantage in every way than Job to survive your struggles and conquer as well. And let's let God teach us today about how you are at a greater advantage than Job in your comfort as you go through your trials as he did through his. So let's take a look at that today and see what God would teach us. And first of all, let's just refresh ourselves in some of the things Job had to endure. We start over there in Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Uh, and that man was blameless and upright who feared God and turned away from evil. Now you know that verse 6 says, There was a day when the sons of God came in to present themselves... Uh, before the Lord. Who are those? Angels, right? And Satan also came amongst them. And the Lord said to Satan, uh, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on all the earth? Uh, a blameless and upright man who turns away from evil, fears God. And Satan answered Job, Does God fear God for nothing? Does Job fear God for nothing? You've put a fence about him and his house and all that he has on every side. You blessed the work of his hands, his possessions have cre increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself did not put forth your hand. And then Satan went out, right? And <coughs> destroyed Job's wealth. And then he uh, destroyed Job's children. Killed them. And then he destroyed Job's health later on. God allowed him to do that. And did Job pass the test? He actually conquered, he endured it, and he never cursed God like Satan said he would. In fact, he says, naked I came from the womb, naked I return. The Lord gave, the Lord's taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. So he won. Now, toward the end, he did start to wobble a bit because he was under a hot, hot endurance trial, but he never cursed God, and so he passed the test. Now, Job was able to do that based on where he was. How much greater of an advantage are you when you go through trials in this life are you than Job? Let's see what God would teach us there. First thing God says to us is this. You, my people, know that you are at such a greater advantage than even righteous Job to go through your trials because I have given you my word. I have given you the Bible, the whole of the scriptures. Job did not have that like you do. Now, Job is supposedly, according to some, the earliest book in the Bible. Some say that. That would mean that before there was Abraham, or Moses, or David and Samuel and the prophets, before there was ever an Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, before there was ever a Peter, James, and John, or a Jesus, and all these scriptures lived Job. Can you imagine going through your trials in life without the word? I mean, totally like defenseless? Now, Job had some revelation. He had the word of the ancients. He had some knowledge and revelation of God. But, like, he was on a toothpick, okay? You have an oak tree, all right, to lean on. God says, in your trials, in your difficulties that you have to face. Think about it. When I face, and I face all troubles too, like you, when I'm worried... I hear Jesus say, look at the birds of the air. God takes care of these. He takes care of the flowers of the field. He's going to take care of you. Right? Be calm, Greg. I got this. When uh, I'm afraid, I can look to Psalm 118. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can man do to me? Right? I have that. Job didn't have this stuff. When I suffer, in all their affliction, God was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them, says Isaiah. Job didn't have that. And then when Job was going through trials and temptations, 
I have this word which he didn't have. No temptation, Greg, is overtaking you. That's not common to everybody. God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond your strength. But with the temptation will also provide the way of escape. That you may be able to endure. Do you know how much Job would have loved to have that word revealed to him in black and white? You got it. And a million more. Job didn't have this. You are at such a greater, I mean such a greater advantage than Job and your present trials. He was standing on a toothpick and he held it fast. Praise God, he was a great man. But you are living at the end of the age, at the close of human history, with all the full revealed will of God, clear as day, clear as a bell, revealed to you and made clear by the apostles in Jesus. I mean, what an advantage. Amen? Amen. You are an advantage. Secondly, God says, unlike Job, my people, I've taught you in the Bible to expect sufferings. You know, Job in his day, at least from the counsel of his friends, seemed to understand the righteous are blessed, have nothing to worry about, the wicked are those who suffer. At least that was Job's friend's counsel, so Job probably believed similarly. And that is true to a certain degree. But you know what? God has told you and me something far greater that Job would have loved to know ahead of time, that the righteous have to suffer too. You know, Job had to go to the school of hard knocks and graduate from that university and get his degree from there. That's a hard university. Amen? Amen. And you and I got to go to that school too, the school of hard knocks to learn these lessons. But Job didn't really get it as we get it. Jesus tells us in in, uh, Luke there, chapter uh, 21, expect this. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be uh, you know, earthquakes, famines, pestilences. Uh, there will be terrors and great signs from the heavens. They'll persecute you. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Don't you like to know that ahead of time? Like, not be blindsided by this? We could t- take a look over at what Paul's counsel was to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3. He says, you yourselves know that this is to be our lot. For when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it, is, as it has come to pass and as you know. So do you guys expect tough times in life yes. as Christians? Yes. Isn't it great and at a, an advantage that you know ahead of time? Now, you know me, I love to sail, I love to go. I wouldn't even mind a storm on the sea, although maybe not totally. <laughs> but I'm not really a big flyer. Did anybody like to fly? Like to get into turbulence? I don't really like turbulence, okay? It's not one of my favorite things. I'm so glad, though, that I have a, a pilot, though, that says, all right, we're going to expect some turbulence soon. Fasten your seatbelts. You know, if you don't hear that, and your pilot doesn't tell you, you hit it, and you fly into the ceiling and crash your head. Right? So even if it's no fun to go through the turbulence, at least God's told us ahead of time, suffering's on the way. Don't worry, I've got this. I'm your pilot. I'll bring you through. Fasten your seatbelt. You know, we have that. Job didn't have it. He was hit blindsided. Peter says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to prove you as if something strange were happening to you. This is required of your brotherhood throughout the world, says Peter. Get ready for it, and now you're all set as you go through it, even though it's tough. Since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same thought. So, are you an advantage, would you say? Whatever, what are you, what trial are you going through today? I mean, God said, be ready for it. You're going to have to go through this. It's hard, but I'm with you. Third advantage is this. God said to Job and his stuff, uh, God said to us, says to us, Job didn't know the purpose of his suffering. You do. I mean, think about that. If you go through and you have no idea why you're suffering. Job there said at least 22 times, Why hast thou made me thy mark? Why have I become a burden to thee? Why do you contend against me? Why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? Why, 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 why? Well, guess what? God says, you got the why. I've told you purpose in, my, in your sufferings. What it's about, at least most of them. For example, what's one of them? We looked last week at Proverbs 17. The crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tries hearts. So one of the purposes of suffering is to... Test us, right? And you got to go through a fire. Do you like the fire? No. Anybody like the fire? I don't like the fire. But you know what? We should like the fire to a certain degree because God's doing something good for us in that testing. 
James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials. For you know that the testing of your faith produces uh, steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So say perfect. Perfect. And complete. Lacking in, lacking in nothing. Can you say that in your trial? That God has put me through this so that I can be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing? He's got good purposes for you. To do you good in the end. So that's a comfort. Job didn't have it. You do. Secondly, let's see if you can guess this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's see if you can find out what the purpose of suffering is here for Paul. He says, We don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the affliction that we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly and bearably crushed that we despaired of life, of life itself. Why, we felt that we'd received the sentence of death. Watch it here now. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And he delivered us. So, what's the purpose of suffering there? To teach us to rely not on ourselves, but on God. To grow your faith. And you know what? I found in my life that the trouble, most troubling times I've gone through has been the times I've drawn the closest to God. Amen? Amen. Right? And my faith has grown the most. I mean, I would really rather not face the trouble, but my goodness, that's a great purpose that God has to draw us to Himself, to build up our faith, because otherwise we just lean on ourselves. But when everything else is ripped away, guess who you lean on? God. And that is for the purpose of ultimately making sure your faith remains strong and you stay saved all the way into his kingdom. Listen to what Peter, uh, sorry, Paul says about suffering. Romans 5, he says, More than that, we rejoice in our suffering. <coughs> Can you do that? Rejoice in your sufferings? He says, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. A hope that does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts from the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. So, is that uh, something that God does to you in your trials? To actually uh, secure you in your salvation? You know, it might just be that some of the tough times you're facing are the very things God is using to make sure you get into His kingdom and stay saved and cling to Him. Think about that next time. Yeah, put that in your pipe and smoke it, right? <laughs> Think about this one, too. Our sufferings, God doesn't just draw us closer together with Him, but to each other. That's another great purpose, don't you? Haven't you seen that? Yes. You know, I had a, I was at the gym the other week, and uh, I was talking with a guy going through tough times, and he, I shared with him about some of Beth's difficulties and our struggles with her health and stuff, and doctors and emergency rooms and surgeries. And he said, how do you do that? How do you get through all those things? I said, you know what? As tough as they are, they've actually been great, because Beth and I have been drawn closer together through our sufferings, that if we never suffered, we wouldn't be nearly as close as we are now to each other as a married couple. And he's like, wow, that's really deep, you know? But that's so true. So closer together with God, closer together with each other, and closer together with Christ and his sufferings. Listen to this word from Peter, which we read part of. Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to prove you as if something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, so that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. So, what's another purpose of our sufferings? You're actually sharing in some mysterious way with Christ's sufferings, says uh, Peter. And I think about when Beth one time, I think before I knew her, she was in an ER room all by herself on a gurney. Terrible pain. Nobody was paying attention to her. It was full. And then it was so full, they actually moved her into a closet. And she was just left there, in this little closet. And uh, she was in pain, and nobody paying attention. And she remembers just crying out to God and saying, Oh Lord, at least in this suffering, I at least have maybe the tiniest little notion of what Jesus suffered for, for me on the cross. You know? And what, who can talk like that except a Christian, Right? In our sufferings, you're actually getting to share in some mysterious way in what Jesus did to suffer and die for you, to take away your sins, atone for them, and give you victory in life. That's fantastic. That's an advantage. Amen? Amen. And then one more here of those. We could look at um, the purpose of conforming you into Christ's image. 
For those whom he foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son. Now, any artists out, artists out there? Sculptors? All right. Uh, if you take a block of wood or a stone and you want to make it look like a person, you've got to chisel it, you've got to whittle it, you've got to sand it, you've got to polish it. It's tough. You saw through this wood ultimately to make it into something. None of that's fun for the block of wood or the block of stone, but God's polishing you to make you look like Jesus. Job didn't get any of this stuff, okay? Uh, maybe an inkling, but very little. Very little revelation. You've got the clear picture. Can't you rejoice in your sufferings? God's told you the purpose and many others of great things he's doing for you. So God says to you right now, if you're suffering, be encouraged, my people. Be encouraged by me. This is working for your good. And then he also says, I've revealed to you something that was never re revealed to Job. At least as you know it. A war in the heavenlies. Right? Job had no idea of this battle that was going on in the unseen places over him, and he was feeling the effects of it in his life on earth. You get it, though. The Word has revealed this to you. We're not contending against flesh and blood human beings, but against princes, principalities, powers, world rulers of this present darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, demons, right? Ephesians 6, we're reading this. And you have a better weaponry. What is it? A breastplate of righteousness. A sword of truth, the word of God, helmet of salvation, right? Belt of truth and, and feet of the gospel of peace. So these things are all yours. And you know what an advantage that is? Job was a victim, really, if you will, in this battle. You are a victor. He lived before Christ conquered Satan. You live after Christ conquered Satan. And let me just share with you, um, I've had, as I've shared with you, times when I've been attacked by evil spirits in my dreams. Remember that? I've told you that? Where I've actually, I'm dreaming, right? And this dream starts to turn dark very quickly. And then a dark figure comes at me, and then boom, pins me down. Like, I literally feel it, spiritually. I mean, I cannot breathe. I'm paralyzed. And they even call it in the medical community sleep paralysis, because so many people have experienced this. Um, and I look to Jesus at those times, and call on his name, and eventually, it loosens his grip and leaves me, okay? But then I was thinking about this the other month, or the other week, and I said, what am I doing being a victim here? I'm a victor, right, in Christ? God's given me divine weaponry, so you know what I started doing? I, a couple weeks ago I did this. I said, here's what I'm going to do. Next time my dream starts turning dark, and an evil spirit starts coming at me, I'm going to instantly flash on me all the armor of light from Ephesians 6, take the sword of the Spirit, a pre-chosen verse, I chose Psalm 27, and I'm going to hit it before it hits me. You know, you don't, you don't go into a battle and get pinned down and then try to start fighting, right? So I tried this. The dream, I've had a few of them since. The dream started turning dark. Evil spirit comes. Boom, flash it on. I say, you know, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold in my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Boom. Before it even gets to me, and boom, I got rid of it. I wasn't pinned down. I destroyed this thing, Okay. You are at such an advantage, is my point, over Job, who is really without these weapons, before Satan was conquered. Jesus is conquered. The weapons are in your hand. You are a victor in your sufferings. Amen? Amen. Say, I am more than a conqueror. Through Christ, Through Christ who loves me. That's amazing advantage, God says. Be encouraged, says the Lord. And unlike Job, God's revealed to us this. That your sufferings are only for, quote, a little while. Say that word if you would, a little while. You know, Job had no idea. He thought he was suffering forever. I'm done. I'm at the end of my rope, and all I got is death and shield ahead of me. You know, what I'm, you know what that seemed like to Job? Death to him was this, Job 10. Are not my days, the days of my life, few? Let me alone that I may find comfort. Before I go where I shall not return to the land of gloom and deep darkness, the land of gloom and chaos, where light is as darkness. Why does he say that? So little was revealed of the afterlife in the days when he lived. All he thought of was gloom and darkness. You know differently through the scriptures, living at the end of time, that you're heading to the land and the kingdom of light and glory in Jesus Christ. That's a great advantage. And your suffering, God says, 
And hear it now from me. He says to you, it's just for a little while, my children. Your present trial, as hot as it may be, just a little while. Then comes triumph and glory. Just a little while. Think of all the times in Scripture God said that. Jesus said to the disciples, I'll not leave you desolate. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. Again, a little while, and you will see me. And no one will take your joy from you. You can look at, uh, at Peter. Resist the devil. Firm in your faith. Knowing that the same experience of suffering is required of everybody, of your brotherhood throughout the world. Watch this. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, and strengthen you. A little while. And then, that's God says, wouldn't Job love to hear this? When you're flying in a plane, don't you like to hear, we have turbulence for a little while, 10 minutes, not like forever. We're not going to crash here. Paul says, for this slight, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. After your little time of trials, my children, God says, is triumph and glory. Just bear with it for a little while, and I will lift you up. And advantage number six of seven, we have the Holy Spirit with us. You know, Job knew, he says, he knows the way that I take. When he's tried me, I'll come forth as gold. He knew, had an inkling, God is with him. But we have the Holy Spirit in us. Never leave us. Never forsake us. And when Beth went into her surgeries where they're removing her, you know, her skull, would you like that? And have your brain moved aside to work on her inner ear like four times? She went in there joking, smiling, uh, quoting scriptures and singing hymns, and the nurses and, doc and the doctors was like, who on earth is this woman, right? We're going to take her skull out, and she's laughing and singing hymns. Christians can do that. She says, because I'm not in the doctor's hands. I'm in the Holy Spirit's hands. I'm in Jesus' hands. He will not fail me. He will not forsake me. And I'm with you always to the close of the age, says Jesus. Job didn't have those revelations, an inkling of them yet. But... We know it in a different way, in the Holy Spirit, in us, in you, in your present trial. Be encouraged, says God. And then fi uh, finally, seventhly, seventhly, <laughs> you know, we know the Savior. Job knew him in part, in a sense, because he says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has thus been destroyed, then from, from my fl flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. So he knew the Lord. He knew of the resurrection of the dead. And that was a hope. But you, so much clearer, clear as a day, clear as a bell, that you know that the will of God is that uh, everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And God, Jesus says, I will raise you up at the last day. You see what Job never saw. You have seen the Christ Jesus. You have heard his words, his teachings. You've seen him suffer for you, die for you, be raised for you, ascended to the heavens for you, coming again in the clouds of heaven. You know these things. Job didn't know what an advantage you have in your Redeemer that you will see him at the last day in your sufferings. So, the Bible, expecting suffering, purposes, your victors in war, more than conquerors, just a little while, and then comes triumph and glory, says God, and my own spirit to be in you. Be encouraged, my people, today in your sufferings. For I will shelter you with my presence, and you shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, and the sun shall not strike you any more, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will be your shepherd. And he will guide you to springs of living water. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.